When you picture a lab experiment that could change the course of humanity, you're probably imagining something flashy. Maybe lightning? Lasers? Maybe a robot muttering something in Latin? Well, in this case, it actually started with some very old mice and a set of proteins that told their bodies it was time for you to grow young again. In a landmark study out of Harvard Medical School, scientists used what are called Yamanaka factors, a set of four genes that can actually reprogram cells and essentially turning back the biological clock. Now, they didn't just slow aging, they reversed it. These old blind mice actually regained their vision. Their organs started regenerating, their muscle function improved, and their cells, which had all the wear and tear of age, began to behave like young cells again. So on this episode of The Archive, we're going to be talking about, is it possible for humans to never age? You have reached the signal. This is The Archive, a safe space for the curious, science, and technology-minded. Hi, if you're new to my channel, I am Steve, and I like to talk about science and technology. I am an enthusiast, and my wife doesn't let me talk about this stuff with her anymore because she gets put to sleep. But if you like that type of stuff, please subscribe to my content, please subscribe to my channel, check out my other videos on other science topics that I've done as well. But right now, what I'm going to talk about is the Yamanaka factors and the breakdown that's involved in what just happened with these aged mice that they were able to reverse their age. Okay, so because the Yamanaka factors sound like something you'd hear in a kung fu anime and not actually out of a biological lab, they're actually named after Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, who won a Nobel Prize for discovering them back in 2006. These are the four genes that I talked about earlier. Here's what they are in the plainest English that I can possibly provide. They are four specific genes known as OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYC that scientists found could actually rewind adult cells all the way back to their embryonic state. Think of them as the master keys to the cell's identity. But here's the wild part. If you tweak the dosage carefully, you don't have to actually erase the cell completely. You can just rejuvenate it. You can wipe away some of the damage, reset the cellular clock without actually deleting the cell's purpose. It's like hitting refresh on a lagging computer. It's not like a full factory reset, but just enough to make it fast again. Now, when they tried it on those aging mice, their bodies started listening. Now, we've all seen Miracle Mouse headlines, but this wasn't one weird mouse. This was actually a repeatable, published, peer-reviewed, and now a biotech company backed by billions in Silicon Valley are racing to bring this to humans. So here's the question. It worked on mice, but will it work on us? Or even what if it worked on us? What if aging wasn't inevitable, like Thanos? What if, in our lifetime, we had the option to reset our biological clocks? I'm not talking about living forever in a cryogenic pod, like I did in one episode that you may or may not have watched. I'm talking about going from 80 back to 40, from disease back to health, from decay back to vitality. And if that's true, what would it mean for everything else? To understand that, we need to unpack why we age in the first place and what actually makes our bodies break down and what the science is doing right now to stop it. Now, I gotta provide a little bit of a disclaimer, just a kind of reality check when it comes to this, before anyone actually starts Googling gene therapy clinics in or around your area, this is not ready for humans. These experiments were done with mice, carefully controlled, and these were short-term trials in a lab that I'm talking about. These are reprogramming human cells because reprogramming human cells is way, way more complex than doing this on mice and could actually cause serious issues like cancer if done wrong. So with that in mind, you can't book an appointment today for something like this. And the research is moving really fast in this field because, you know, billionaires are backing it. And the fact is that we've gotten really far in the process, but it's just worth paying attention to from a science perspective. I will say this, however, my wife did show me pictures of the Kardashian mom, and it did make me wonder if human trials might actually have started. Because, wow, 
that's impressive. So in the grand scheme of thing, I don't think a lot of people think about this, but why do we age? So this is going to give us an opportunity to back up a little bit because in all actuality, that's a really big question. Why do we age? We should really understand what aging actually is. And I know most of us think of aging as just getting old, the wrinkles, the joint pains, forgetting why you walked into a room, which happens way too much nowadays for me. Under the hood, aging is just a cascade, a full body systems failure made up a bunch of small breakdowns that are happening at the cellular level. And here are the five major reasons your body ages, whether you like it or not. Number one, and I love this because it's called zombie cells. Now, these zombie cells, they're not like the brain eating kind, but the ones living inside you right now. They're called sensin cells. Hopefully I said that right. These are the cells that stop dividing, but they don't die. And instead of going quietly into the great night, they scream at everyone around them. Kind of like my mom when she gets mad. She doesn't just scream at me, she screams at everybody. So everybody thinks they did something wrong, even though it was all my fault. There's a lot to unpack there. So why do cells stop dividing? Great question. One of the things is because the telomeres are shortening, which I'll get into in a little bit of what a telomere is. But there's just also DNA damage, radiation, toxins, metabolic stress. These are just things that you live through. Imagine you go outside in the sun and you get a sunburn. That is going to break down cells on the surface of your face and other places that you might not have covered correctly. So it's just life in general. And why are these zombies the problem? So they release, say, SP. These are like inflammatory cytokines. They damage surrounding tissue and accelerate aging. And they're linked to diseases like arthritis, cancer, and Alzheimer's. It's like having a retired coworker who won't leave the office and keeps just yelling at everyone. Bob, you know who you are. And the big question is when it comes to these zombie sentient cells, can we get rid of them? Drugs like docetinib plus quercetin in mice, they have restored vitality and they extend lifespans. But not all sentient cells are bad. Some actually help in wound healing and cancer suppression. So it's really all about balance when it comes to trying to get rid of these things. So number two, when it comes to aging is just inflammation. So inflammation in general is your body's version of setting off an alarm system. I mean, it's useful until it never shuts off. And as we age, immune regulation weakens. You have chronic low grade inflammation that sets in called inflammaging. And number three, we talked about telomeres and telomeres, they're like those plastic shoelace tips that stop your DNA from fraying. These actually start shortening over their lifetime and every cell division shortens your telomeres. Eventually they get so short that they trigger cell sentience or death, if you will. Telomeres can rebuild them, but overuse is also linked to cancer. And then number four is mitochondrial breakdown. So mitochondria is like your cell's battery pack but even batteries degrade over time. Mitochondria mutate with age and reduce energy output. Now, this leads to oxidative stress and cellular burnout, and is strongly linked to neurodegeneration and muscle wasting. And then lastly, the cause of aging is epigenetic drift. Your DNA is a perfect script, but your cells forget sometimes how to read it. So epigenetic markers tell cells which genes to turn on or off. And over time, these markers degrade or shift. Cells forget their roles. So skin cells might get confused and act as liver cells and misfire. So yeah, in short, aging is just entropy. It's your body slowly breaking down from all the life that you lived and every little hit that you've taken, it adds up after a while. But now that we've understood why we age, Let's talk about what science is doing to stop it. Because honestly, it's not science fiction anymore. It's happening right now. Okay, here's the hopeful part when it comes to all of this, is that scientists around the world aren't just studying aging. They're trying to stop it, or at least slow it down so much that it hardly matters anymore. Now, these are talking clinical trials, and these are biotech startups. Uh, we have Nobel winning labs that are a part of it, and most importantly, billions and billions of dollars in funding from billion heirs because they do want to live forever it seems and it seems like what they're discovering almost sounds like science fiction until you read the footnotes now let's look at the front lines of the longevity movement now at the beginning part of this we talked about the yamanaka factors and this is called partial reprogramming 
In mice partial reprogramming, it actually improved vision, organ health, and lifespan. And human trials are now in early phases with startups like Altos Labs and New Limit. Can't stress this enough. You can't schedule this right now, but they are test trialing it in some form or fashion somewhere in the world. Number two, we talked about the senolytic drugs. These are designed to kill or silence sentient cells. You know, the zombie cells? It's a combination of docetinib and quercetine. This combination has shown to improve health span in mice. And Unity Biotechnology is testing human applications for things like osteoarthritis and eye disease. And number three, you're looking at mitochondrial boosters, these things called NAD+, NAD+. And NAD+, levels decline with age, impairing energy production. So supplements like NMN and NR aim to restore NAD+. Studies show improved metabolism, brain function, and muscle performance from these supplements. Then there is CRISPR and genetic editing. So CRISPR-Cas9 allows precision DNA editing. And it, right now it's being used in trials for blood disorders, eye diseases, and now a potential aging reversal process. I can't stress this enough. Highly, highly experimental, but powerful potential. And lastly, the one that we all hate to hear about the most, but honestly, it's lifestyle interventions. Not all anti-aging breakthroughs come in a syringe. So things like caloric restrictions shown to extend lifespans in every species tested. The dreaded exercise. This maintains mitochondrial health and DNA expression and sleep. Oh, sleep. I knew you were gonna come in there somewhere, but sleep clears brain toxins and does repair damaged tissues. These are the lifestyle interventions that we can do today. So now that we've got all of that out of the way, which is the why and the how, the cells, the science, the breakthroughs are all great. But I think one thing that we don't typically do when it comes to science is zoom out and look at what the consequences of something like living forever actually mean. So if we actually pull this off, if aging becomes optional, what happens to everything else? I mean, what happens to relationships, careers, cultures, overpopulation? From a science fiction perspective, you can watch speculative ideas happen when this does occur, but let's step into a future where basically no one dies of old age. All right, I'm gonna crack open the biggest can of worms, and if science really does make aging optional, what happens next? And the goal here isn't to panic you or sell you on some utopian future. It's to stay curious and ask questions that nobody's really ready for yet. So right now we have a what we thought was an overpopulation issue years and years ago, but let's start with the elephant in the room. If people stop dying and we make more people, where do they all go? I mean, the current Earth population is around 8 billion and climbing. And I saw one study that said that there might even be currently way more than 8 billion because we've miscounted somehow. But birth rates are falling in most countries, but if death slows down too, resources will become strained. I mean, food, water, housing, energy, this could trigger geopolitical shifts. Richer nations staying alive longer and poorer nations aging traditionally. And what about relationships, family, and marriage? If you and your partner both live to 200 years, are you still married at 167? Honey, if you're watching this, of course we'd still be married at 167. Got you. But do we recreate term-based marriages? And then there's generational identity blurs. You have four plus generations alive at once. You have parent and child power dynamic shifts. What happens when you're 75 and your mom is still 108 and thriving? Ask the King of England. He kind of gets the idea of that. And let's talk about careers and just purpose in general. If retiring at 65 is no longer the option and your career can span centuries, do we finally all chase purpose over paychecks or does work become a cycle that we're consistently trapped in? By the way, that one sounds awful. But talk about constant retraining and job evolution. These would be some of the most essential things that you would have to do. I would see retirement systems collapse unless we somehow redefined it. I mean, you can't have a pension that lasts 100 plus years, could you? Then there's the creative renaissance. With more time, people may explore more vocations. So there's a lot that can happen just from a career perspective. And then there's just mental health and time perception. Would life get more precious or would it get less precious? 
When you can live forever, how do you deal with boredom, loss, or apathy? I mean, time richness may reduce the urgency or excitement to really do anything. I can see more mental burnout or existential fatigue, this becoming more of a real thing, and you'll have identity crises. If you reinvent yourself every 40 years, then who are you really? And this might, in the end, increase the risk of voluntary life closure. I can't say the word, but you know what I'm talking about. So people choosing to opt out when the purpose is lost to them. So if aging stops, everything changes. Our ethics, our politics, our definitions of success. We'd have to really redefine education. We'd have to redesign law, medicine, religion. We'd have to reimagine what it means to actually be human. And I mean, you're looking at things like space colonization might accelerate as a population pressure increases. You have political systems that may shift toward wisdom or stagnation in some circumstances. So you got the same leaders, but really longer term values. This might create a rift, the long lived versus the natural aging. Would there be two different types of groups or populations? So that's my idea of what could happen in the future. And obviously we can't live forever now, so we don't have to speculate on that aspect of it, but it does bring into some ideas of what it could be. And it doesn't take much to challenge what the future could look like just by making one small change today. But that's the future, maybe, possibly, who knows? We may not get there tomorrow, but we're closer than you think. And the questions we ask now about meaning, love, legacy, and life, they matter more than ever. So thank you all for sticking with me through this. We came into this asking a simple question. What if aging could be reversed? But the answers that we found were anything but simple. We're on the edge of something big, a scientific frontier where aging might not define us anymore. Where 80 could be the new 30, where Legacy isn't about what you leave behind, but how long you choose to carry it. And what we know is that cellular aging is no longer a mystery. We can influence it. There's scientific evidence for that. Tools like the Yamanaka factors, Xenolytics, and CRISPR are pushing the limits. Lifestyle, mindset, and environment still play a huge role. But what we don't know is what happens to purpose when life becomes indefinite. How will society adopt or adapt to a post-aging reality? And will emotional weight of life become heavier or lighter? And this begs the question, maybe aging is nature's way of creating urgency. Maybe death gives life its sharpness. But maybe, just maybe, what comes next isn't about erasing death, but rethinking what life is. I mean, what would you do with more time? Who would you become if time wasn't the enemy? This is the edge of a new generation, or what I like to call, possibly, the never-ending generation. And once again, if this episode sparks something in you, share it, leave a comment. What would you do if you had 200 years to live? And hit subscribe for more science that's asking some bigger questions. This is The Archive. 